from it. There's the other boy who killed our minister, Okelo Ngora, that he was getting allowances for being a bodyguard. If you are going to get allowances for being a bodyguard, how about the ones in Congo? Why, why would they not get allowances? And you who's riding around in Kampala, you get allowances. For what? But that's because they were not implementing the collective answer. When I am away from where I am, from my home, I, what I need is food. I should get food. Because I can't take the food of my my family where, where I'm deployed. And I think that's what is always provided for. Operation Russian, you call it. Yeah. But money, 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 money. When you take that lie, you will never, you will never be able to defend the country. This is the problem of Somalia. Somalia is a big country. It's three times the size of Uganda in land area. It needs a big army. Now, if you start saying salaries, allowances, you cannot build a big army. You will end up with a small army, 10,000, like in Somalia now. How many soldiers do you have? 10,000. What can 10,000 do in Somalia? Somalia needs a army of maybe 200,000, 300,000. Ignorance is good. You know, when you are ignorant, it's also good. <laughs> because it's not good to know too many things. That's how people get blood pressure. You take a, a huge country like Congo, with the, 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 these Europeans, brigade, uh, brigade, woman, brigade. What can a brigade do in Congo? Congo is about the same size as India in land area. You are not like me. You have big phones which have stories about the whole world. Me, my phone is only for ringing, not for, not for rumor mongering. But for you, you have got this mobile phone which have got all. You go and check. What is the size of the Indian army? One and a half million people. This is how you defend a, a country like, like, like India. You cannot defend it with a brigade. You, know, yeah. you look at people, you still pity for Africa. How can Africa be so unfortunate? So, you need big numbers. And if you need big numbers, and you, you make it each, each person very costly in terms of money. How will you manage? That means you don't have the numbers. And you are more backward than the Banyangori. To, to be backward than the Banyangori is not a good idea. Because the Banyangori were more advanced. The Banyangori say, and we you clear at the ranches. If you are making alarm for food, you make a small one. So that people don't hear and come too many. But if you are making alarm for war, you make a wide, a big one. So which, which alarm are you making now? Are you making for food? If you think war is food, then you continue. You discover. Uh -huh. You discover that it's not a good idea. We need numbers. And if we, that's why the strategy of the NRA was we need, by the time we, we launched RIF, reduction in force, was it 1990 or something? Uh -huh. Our army was 100,000. That's how we managed to control the whole country. 
were to cut it down. But even when we cut it down, we are to convert the money into what we call force multipliers, buying aircraft, buying what, not spend on welfare because we couldn't manage. So therefore, implementing these collective welfare formulas is the correct way. The late General Ronda implemented the formula of the Wazarendo. Has it not helped the soldiers? Has it helped you? A mess idea. Uh -huh. Now, if Wazarendo has helped you, why then not the others? Why do we, don't, don't you implement all the others? The ones we have been, which I, I guided from the beginning, the good thing is that me are right. I have understood why these people are writing the Bible. Somebody writes to, to, to you write. St. Paul to the Corinthians, to, to the these ones. To, to, when you are in heaven, people will check. The man who wrote, I, I always write. Why then not all the others? The barracks so that the soldiers do not have to stay in the Mizuko, in trading centers. Army schools for soldiers' children. Health units for soldiers and their families. Salary loans. You know, we had, because we had said the children of the soldiers should study free in the primary schools, in the secondary schools. Maybe we could even talk of technical schools. But for university, we thought we, we may not manage to build separate universities. That's why, therefore, we had an idea of the salary loans. If a soldier has got a child going to university for self-sponsorship, but biological child, not, not your uncles, not your clan, no, no, no. Yours. Those are the for war. You, you could, we talked about it, but we didn't conclude. The, you get a loan, you pay for your child, uh, and then the, the, the army deducts from the salary this time <coughs> to recover the money. That was one of the ideas to, to, to fi find a solution for that. Fill the gaps and UPDF will be formidable. Long live the memory of our fighters at the General Ronda. May the Almighty God bless their descendants and reward their patriots. I'm very happy to see the Aronda clan, to see Mama Jarakaoza. That's an old comrade of mine. These others, uh, the other one is James M. Simi. These are, must be the new people. Because, uh, oh, this is Aronda's wife. You are the oh, oh good. Uh -huh. and, and oh yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. And the bearded man, he looks like a hosa. You, you are a brother. Oh, okay. Kahosa was a footballer. I can tell he was a very good footballer. So, thank you for, who organized this? this uh, because re remembering people is a good thing. <laughs> and, and when you, first of all, it's good to remember people, because 
the one who are remembered is good for them and for their families. But also, you educate the new ones. Like now, you have invited me, and I have given you some free consultancy. I don't need any payment from anybody, just to pass on what, what, what we know. So I think this is a good culture. Maintain it, I congratulate you. Thank you very much. military and national history. His leadership during critical moments had an effect on the outcomes of conflicts and on national security. By remembering him, we preserve these lessons for future generations. General Ronda's story and many other heroes, because he's a representation of the many heroes we have had in UPDF uh, provide a powerful example of courage, dedication, and commitment. Honoring their legacies will inspire current and future leaders in the military and in, civi and in the civilian spheres to exhibit similar qualities. This indeed is the main objective of this memorial function. We want to inspire the young uh, officers and men of UPDF to follow the example of great heroes like uh, General Ronda. We remember General Ronda not just for his military achievements, but for his ethical conduct 
and principled leadership. He offers an example of how to balance power with responsibility and humility. By honoring him, we acknowledge the personal sacrifices he made, as indeed many officers and men in the UPDF make on a daily basis. Sacrifices of personal safety, health, or even their lives uh, for the greater good of, of this country. Honoring his legacy is a way to ensure that his contributions are not forgotten. For all these reasons, it is right and good that we honor his memory with the various lectures that have been planned over this two-day period and with the inauguration of the first Kampala Defense and Security Expo. Congratulate the Ministry of Defense and Veterans Affairs for organizing this event, and I wish you all fruitful deliberations. Thank you very much, Asante. My name is Ole Ruhuda Abasan, the State Minister of Defense in charge of Veteran Affairs. I am here representing my senior, Honorable Obof Obof Matson, who is representing us as a ministry in Parliament today, when Parliament is going to pay tribute to our beloved State Minister Defense in charge of defense. I take this singular duty to welcome you all to this opening ceremony of the late Honorable General Aronda Memorial Function at Muyonyo Commonwealth this 10th day of September 2024. As you may recall, the late Honorable General Aronda passed on in the line of duty on 11th December 2015, while serving as the Minister of Internal Affairs. Your Excellency, sir, and distinguished guests, the culture of commemorating the life, achievements, and legacy of the fallen national heroes is a major building block in communicating a correct ideology and inculcating national values among the citizens. It's a key avenue for inspiring the new generation to enable them appreciate the importance of rendering selfless service to one's country. Your Excellency, sir, while officiating at the 7th Joan Kagezi Memorial Lecture at Kololo Ceremonial Grounds on 5th of April 2024, you remarked, I quote, when you recognize these annual lectures in the memory of Joan, you are creating a culture of gratitude to the people who serve and sacrifice. It is not for the country, it's not, it's not good for the country to have a culture of forgetting somebody who has died. And so it's very good that you organize these annual lectures. Your Excellency, sir, that quotation you made has inspired us as a minister of today to be here. Therefore, it is in the same vein the Minister of Defense and Veteran Affairs 
specifically the UPD leadership, recognize the need to honor the late Honorable General Aronda in order to entrench a culture of honoring its military heroes. It's key to inspiring patriotism in new generations and values that should be emulated and as a way of maintaining track of our military history, Your Excellency, sir. Your Excellency and all the invited guests, this memorial event is a three-day dimensional event, starting today 10th to 12th of September 2024, under the theme celebrating the life of the late Honorable General Randa, a paragon of revolutionary sacrifice, pan-Africanism, patriotism, courage, and an accomplished freedom fighter. That is our theme for today, Your Excellency. The late Honorable General Aronda is being remembered for his invaluable achievements and contributions to Uganda's security, political, socio-economic landscape. And his pan-Africanist approach to the regional issues, particularly the integration of the East African community. This memorial event will therefore give recognition and pay tribute to the late General Aronda's leaders and invaluable contribution and a selfless service to our country since his tragic demise nine years ago. It is meant to reflect his life, his achievement, and his legacy. Your Excellency, sir, the following are the activities that will be carried during the time we are here. One is the ever Kampala First and Security Expo to showcase the UPDF capabilities under its defense industries, which you have just officially opened. Thank you for visiting the Sir, the next activity will be lectures and discussions by eminent personalities within and outside the UPDF, which will take place tomorrow, Wednesday 11th, but beginning today by the keynote address that you are going to give us, Your Excellency, sir. Lastly, your Excellency, we will have a memorial thanksgiving service and land on to crown the three-day event on Thursday 12, September 2024. Your Excellency, sir, and invited guests, the commemoration of the late Honorable General Aronda's unwavering and selfless commitment to the service of the UPDF and his country with integrity is inefficient to result in the following activities. One, it will lay a foundation for ethical leadership and will inspire young and upcoming military and civilian leaders to the selfless service of their country. Two, it will enhance efforts towards defense diplomacy and promoting a regional cooperation in achieving the peaceful conflict resolution and unity within the country, the East African region and beyond, Your Excellency. It will strengthen the values of Pan-Africanism, patriotism, dedication and selfless service for the current and future leaders, with emphasis on their importance to the national peace, unity, stability, and prosperity. Lastly, 
sewing, sewing a case product of the defense industries as evidence of successfully professionalizing and modernizing of the UPDF under the able and the visionary leadership of your excellence, the president and the commander in chief of the UPDF. Your excellence today, as a minister of defense, we are showing a case of what you have done for all those years to professionalize, to modernize our UPDF. Your Excellency, sir, before I now invite you to give your key note address, our memorial function chaired by CDF and comprising of the members of peers of Minister of Defense and generals and senior officers of the UPDF and the team for their relentless efforts in steering the organization of this important and impactful memorial function. I want to thank you for all that work you have done as a committee. In addition to that, I extend my appreciation to the implementation committee of late Honorable General Aronda Memorial Faction, which is the technical arm of the steering committee. It's 238 million, actually. And today, you are talking of a mild trillion shilling circle. Lieutenant General Sam Kavuma, the current Wazalendo board chairman and Atmos Force Commander in Somalia, highlights the circle's strengths to date. Wazalendo circle now is the number seven in the circles of in the continent of Africa. And the first six, those six that are ahead of us, are all, are all Kenyan cooperatives and circles. This was a rendo, was started, I think, by Aronda. We had talked about it, but it had remained just a talk. But when Aronda came, he, 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 he pushed it. In the same spirit of ensuring the well-being of soldiers and their families, General Ronda conceived the idea of constructing an Apex UPDF National Referral Hospital, currently under construction in Buya. Hey there, this just starts. It's going to break a ground, then the rest <laughs> will fall in line. So we broke ground. But after that, what we did was to make sure that uh, we put aside funds from uh, the Atmis remittances that were specifically for you know, uh, support of the soil management area and uh, also buying some other things for the mission. And, uh, this is what we put on the hospital. And we started. And right now, the hospital is almost complete and it's beautiful. And uh, we are proud, you know, at least to know that uh, Aronda took a step in spite of having no hope of getting money. We did to go there. And we opened the ground. And uh, after that, had to come. But he's also someone who put emphasis on education of the uh, soldiers' children, on uh, their health. So he set up a number of medical centers in uh, different units. He set up uh, and promoted schools. So he really cared for the welfare of the, of the soldier. General Aronda, under the guidance of His Excellency Yori Kagutan Museveni, spearheaded the creation of the UPDF Spouses Desk, which has since been expanded into a department as a support system to the soldiers out on duty on the front line. The department provides skills development, psychosocial support, financial literacy, and implements income-generating activities for wives of UPDF officers 
and Mrs. Rebecca Mogume, the Principal Social Development Officer in the UPDF, explains. By that time, people were at war, people were moving everywhere, and uh, women were staying at home most of the time. So with this introduction of social work and skills development and training and empowerment to the women, they've grown their money, they've grown themselves, the, the welfare has changed, the domestic violence has come down because of the contribution of the women to the family matters, into supporting the man who's always on the, you know, on the go on deployment, on training. General Aronda's legacy is deeply embedded in his tireless work ethic and commitment to service, exemplified during his tenure as Minister of Internal Affairs. He would come to Karamoja third Division, he spent three days, and it is like Easter Friday. You think the big man is going to back to Kampara to have Easter with his family. Then the next day you hear he's sending a message in Nzara, in South Sudan. Hey, you mean this man did not go home? Supervision. And that's why he achieved that You felt his presence in whatever you are doing. And he, he, he would do celebrate your, your successes and tells you he's well known as someone who was a, a work colleague. He used to work, I think, maybe 24 hours. I don't know if he ever went home before midnight. And even the period I worked with him, I'd never seen him take a leave. He would not even get lunch. He would work <laughs> during working, during lunch time. And uh, you'd find uh, like a piece of boboya on his bed, <laughs> and that would be his lunch. Yeah. So, the, and uh, even beyond that, who's sometimes you'd call you and it's eight o'clock in the night, and then you ask him, Where are you? I'm still at tissue doing ABCD. Uh, he got his, he damaged his back while uh, commanding, um, I think, Iron Fist. Operation Iron Fist in the north, around 2001, 2002. He damaged his back, and he, he told us how he did, how it got damaged. And it really went on worsening the pain in the back. Then, one time, Patrick asked him, Aron, why don't you go to hospital? And they sort out this back. He said, Patrick, where is the time? Huh? The way used to, where is the time? Where is the time? Uh, yeah. And uh, indeed, the guy thought he shouldn't even waste a minute on a hospital bed. Person who never even uh, 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 succumbed to forces of biological <laughs> biological demands. You go in a meeting, once he's seated, <laughs> you must be careful if you have gone without uh, eating enough. Because the meeting will start at 8 in the morning, close at midnight, and he's steady, he's chairing it, and it's normal. If he was given a task to work, he would, he would, he would leave no stone unturned. And I remember vividly what happened when we went to the Ministry of Internal Affairs. And some of us, civilian friends, were saying, this man is a, <laughs> he's driving us like a military man. He doesn't know that you're civilian. But what he wanted was to, to see that the job is done. He set the ball rolling for the National Identification ID Project, which had stalled for decades. As minister, and national coordinator of the national ID. There are hardly any words which can fit how much he put in. He never slept from the word go. Under the able leadership of General Aronda, combed the whole country and made sure that all Ugandans 
knew what was going to happen and what, how it would happen. He made sure Ugandans got their first national identity cards. The exercise was uh, successfully executed. We were able to register 16.5 million Ugandans. And all of this was uh, because of the effort and selflessness of General Arunda. Set up NIRA, that agency. We are now in the process of mass enrollment, uh, but we are building on the foundation of General Aronda. A highly disciplined officer, General Aronda was a sworn teetotaler even during the tough bush war times. Lieutenant General Sam Kabuma recalls his very first impression of General Aronda in the early days, attached to the then Presidential Protection Unit as young officers with differing outlooks on life at the time. I want to confess that my first impression about that General Aronda Nyapeiro, my comrade, was a negative one. That one I must confess. Because reason being, <coughs> Aronda disliked all the habits I treasured. So definitely, we could uh, not be friends. But later, uh, that was, uh, we were young, but uh, later as we, we moved on, growing, both in age, in ranks and in responsibilities, I started knowing who exactly General Ronda was, and this time positively. A man of vision and courage, General Aronda instilled in others the values he held dear, leaving a mark on the DNA of the UPDF. General Aronda, those who have uh, been keen about serving, we are greatly impacted. Some of us can easily see them, the way they do their work. Uh, we, uh, at times, they make you remember the Aronda, the, the very commander. The Aronda motivated many people, many of these young officers, you know. He groomed them, he identified them, he pressed them where he thought they would deliver. He motivated them, and uh, some of us, we are, we are partly because of his motivation. And we salute you. I had the testimonies and the testimonies of officers whenever I interacted with them. They used to call uh, him the godfather of the army. So what lessons are there? Nobody cares about what I did. It, 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 it undermines even the president. It is not fair, uh, but also you, you deny the president's generation of the input of these people. Because this input can be, it was important that time, but it is important also for the one of today to learn. He may no longer take his giant gentle walk among us, but General Aronda's spirit lives on in the hearts of those he touched. May his legacy endure and guide us towards a future infused with the values he held dear for a better Uganda and the region. Your Excellency, sir, it's now time to make your keynote address. Let's put our hands together. Do you hear me? His Lordship, the Chief Justice, 
the Honorable Ministers, the Chief of Defense Forces, other generals, and all the officers and militants of the UPDF, and the family of General Aronda. You cannot talk about Aronda without talking about the, the history of Africa. Because the NRA struggle was not just a military struggle. It was first and foremost a political struggle which had to, in the end, use the military means to solve these problems. So therefore, since the political struggle is a long story, I, I wanted to recommend to the seminar, the ones who are involved in this, a speech I made in 2020. It is entitled, How Africa Missed the Bus of History. This booklet gives you very detailed analysis of how Africa got left behind. Now, the, the, the short speech, which I will read here, is an attempt to contextualize that long story and point out where the around us come in. In this short speech, I wrote, you cannot talk of the late General Aronda Nyakirima's role or that of, the, of other NRA UPDF personnel without understanding the Africa of 1900 at the dawn of colonialism and what happened subsequently. While much of Africa had been ravaged by the slave trade for 400 years, by that time, by 1900, our part of Africa had not been so much affected by the slave trade, although there were some isolated incidents of slave snatching. That's why Banyankore believed that Goans were cannibals, that Goans were our Gohan Bariyavant. They believed that Goans, I don't know why they thought of Goans, but I think it was because of this kidnapping by the slave traders. The late Aron Muhinda, I remember very well, died in 1955 when I was in primary three, had been liberated from slavery at the coast of Mombasa. He's the grandfather of our permanent secretary for tourism, Silva Katsime. I don't know whether Katsime Silva knows this. Our grandfather, Aron Muhinda, had been taken as a young slave boy to Mombasa. And that's where he was liberated by 
by the missionaries, Bishop Taka. And, and, and when, when, she was there, when he was there, he met a Munyoro woman who had also been kidnapped, a girl, and they, they got married and produced Katsushima's father. This is this piece. Who was named Kuku after Dr. Albert Cook. You remember the other Cook? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So th this man died in 1955 when I was in primary three and, and I, I was. in tribal wars fomented by the bankrupt kings and then sold in slavery. However, the whole of Africa and indeed our part of Africa was still in the pre-capitalist mode of production and society. The societies were feudal or pre-feudal primitive communalism societies. The production of wealth was organized in Emyoga. This word which I encouraged you to use recently was organized in Emyoga, specialized skills. I would use the Nyankore versions, but you can put them in any, any other language. Such as Okhinga, growing crops, Kurisa, herding cattle, and general livestock keeping, Okhesha, blacksmithing, Okubeja, Carpentry, Okunogora, Potare, Okomaga. Okomaga, this is making back cloth. Oktanaga. You know, these people are very advanced. They were doing everything. Oktanaga. That is making bows and arrows. Okurema, shoe making. Okhara, leather making. Okujuba, fishing. Okhara, leather making. And I have repeated that. Okshachira, general medical work. Okuragura, divination. Okujenga, surgery. You know, this you've had, had, had surgeons. Abajenji, who could remove bones from, from inside you. Sailing, they had professional water people called Abadimbi. That's what they were called. This is Rinyankwere, you can go and put it in, in other dialects. These yoga were being done by, the, by communities. A community could specialize in something, the whole community. By communities, clans, you could have the clan of Abahes. They are known that that clan is a clan of blacksmith. They do it as a clan. Or, 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 or families on a hereditary basis, yeah. on a hereditary basis. I am a, I am a blacksmith, blacksmith. My, 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 my children and grandchildren will be blacksmith. And everybody knows that that's what we do. We, we don't go into crops. The Muhesi doesn't go into crops. The people do crops and they bring them to him. And then he gives them all. Uh, 
they would then Okturka butter trade with the other families to get what they, 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 they needed but did not make themselves. The long distance trade to the coast was being done by the Abalunganwa. This is a corruption of the Swahili word Wawungwana. This is Banyankore here say, ah, this is Balungano. But it meant Wawungwana. You can hear some names called Karungano. Some family, if you check, people are using those names. These were mainly the Banyamwezi from Tabora in Tanzania. That tribe from Tabora, the Wanyamwezi, were the ones doing this trade between the inland here and the coast, the coast of East Africa. They would bring textiles, a meander, glass beads, and kwanzi. When you hear this, Tian Kwanzi, which the Waganda mispronounce as Tian Kwanzi. It is Tian Kwanzi. I, I, I think they called it, they named it Tian Kwanzi because it is flattish, as you can see, it is flattish. And when it rains, you get some floods which then shine in the sun like, like beads. I, I, this, is what, this is what I think. That, I think that's what they call it, Tian Kwanzi. Because th that Tian Kwanzi means the place of the beads, of, of the glass beads. Uh, guns. They would bring guns. The people from the coast, these guns had, had started coming. Mbundu, of ganga, gunpowder, and so on. There was some limited use of cowrie shells, cowrie shells, and CMB as money. That is why one of the words for money is a CMB. <laughs> Even today, the old people would call money a CMB because of the cowrie shells. The other word for money is empiha, rupia. From, uh, empiha from rupia. Because that was the currency being used in India when the British were, were, were here. So they were bringing it here, rupia, my, my grandfather was using Rupiha. If you, if you hear songs praising my grandfather, they would say he, he bought a cow with Rupiha as part of praising him that he was a wealth creator. However, so this was the, when you are talking about Aronda, what all these big people go back to where did it all start? It starts with the politics. Uh, the politics about what? About society. So that's why I want you to go back. So this was the economy of Uganda and maybe Africa before colonialism, before 1900. However, the pre-colonial dominant mode of trade was by butter trade with mainly Abebunzi. Abebunzi are, are the itinerant, itinerant hawking traders. These who go around with hawking, those are called Abebunzi. Okubunzia is to hawk. The Luganda word for hawkers is, I think, abatembei. What about Luganda one? Luganda enough day. Me work here there. What about Luganda? 
That's how the ANC was founded in 1912. By the time we came on the scene as, as a student movement, but also as youth members of the new colonial political party of Uganda at that time, we had to distill. Actually, I'm trying to say a long story, but I'm trying to, to, to summarize. But the real, real story is here. We had to distill accurate political ideas from the confusion that characterizes many struggles. Because you see, it, people have many, a lot of confusion. This one is saying this, this one is saying that. Everybody is, is, is an expert. The they don't discuss, they just take positions. So it's very dangerous because if you, as I was telling some people, political work is like medicine. The doctor must study the patient. This patient, what is he suffering from? You look at the signs, you look at the symptoms. If you can check the blood and so on, then you make a diagnosis. If you make a correct diagnosis, then you'll be able to, to give a correct prescription. But if you make a wrong diagnosis, <laughs> and you make a wrong prescription, the patient will die. And this is what has happened. African countries have actually died. If you see what's happening in Somalia, what's happening in Sudan, Khartoum, imagine Khartoum. Khartoum is a very powerful country. But now, see what's happening there. Congo, diagnosis. Incorrect diagnosis. So th this is what we have to deal with as a student movement when we came up. And we are part of this, some of us were part of those political parties, DP, UPC, and all that. In particular, we had to reject the politics of identity of tribes and religion that the opportunists were pushing that time and ever since. Imagine somebody says, we form a party of Catholics. That's how DP was formed in 1954. We need ours, a chaffee, ours, megwa, megwa. Even if something is rotten, but megwa. Megwa is actually for, for our, for a chaffee. You don't know our language. Me, I'm always busy with my people. Then the, the UPC now, the, 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 the protesters, our oh, the, the, the Catholics have beaten us. Let's form ours. So they form the UPC. Now, a, a man called Ikem Sars. Had he tried, but now this, old, this man started in the 1920s, was organizing the unions, the farmers, the, from the, the 1930s, 
or 20s. So after I came, SAS was organizing in a national basis. And in 1952, he formed the Uganda National Congress. This Kare, 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 Kare his father, Kare Chis, John Kare, was a very active member of that UNC. He died in the plane going to Russia uh, from Cairo. He had an office in Cairo, the, the father of John Kare, of this Kare here. He's the one who has called John Kare. Is this one a Christian or what? <laughs> what is, what is your, your real name? Tarekehura. Edward. <laughs> no, nobody knows anything about him. His Christianity is not known. So, these people, John Carey, had left a seminary. He was after he had left seminary, John Carey, and I came south, and others. For them, they were, they were forming a national party, Uganda National Congress. Then the, the, uh, these people, the, 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 the Catholic elite, say, ah, uh -uh, we don't want this one of all. We want ours. DP, 1954, Mubwanya, and I don't know who, the, Sebastian Chihuka and others. Then the UPC, 1960, oh, the Catholics have beaten us, we should form ours. So theirs was UPC. Then the, our wonderful member group, Kabaka Yeka, 1961, formed Kabaka So that's how we got, these were the politics we found ourselves in. And they will say, Echeit, 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 Megwa. You as who? You, you, of course, you would know what they are talking about. In particular, we are to reject the politics of identity of tribes and the religion that the opportunists were pushing that time and ever since. After a decade of analysis, by the time we, we metamorphosed into a liberation movement with the launch of the anti-Amini struggle, we had arrived at a diagnosis of what we thought was the problem of Uganda and maybe Africa. We identified three problems. And these are lack of prosperity. Lack of prosperity, what I told you. Poor housing, poor hygiene, poor health, and so on. No education, no transport. Secondly, lack of strategic security. Thirdly, the failure to use the clear brotherhood of the African peoples. The lack of prosperity has already been described above. Poor housing, lack of education, poor health, poverty, etc., etc. What is the medicine for that? The answer is to create prosperity. But then the question is, where does prosperity come from? Our answer is that it comes from every adult, every adult, Omotiya no Mukuru, participating in the production of a good or a service that is then sold. This is our answer. To create prosperity, every adult 
must participate. Participate. You can participate as an, as an entrepreneur, you are the owner of the business. Or you participate as a worker for the entrepreneur, but you participate. You must participate in producing a good or a service and selling it. If you do that sustainably, you will get money. As you produce a good or a service, you must have a chibaro. Chura. Otita. Do you know Rukbar? Have you ever seen Rukbar, how they look like? Oh, there's a Rukbar here. Our default. The Chivaro is Otita. Aymar. Aymar is Ateso Akaramajong. Calculating the maximum returns in earnings from the selected enterprise. You see how efficient our languages are. When I, when I, I tell you to do something with the Chivaro, I don't have to, to add all these wrong things. Calculating the wrong word. Very efficient. Your people, the, the only problem of the African people was leadership, political. But otherwise, everything else language, food, culture, very, very, very powerful. Agriculture, uh, language. This one, I don't, I don't have to describe it. Calculate, oh, Finish. I don't have to add anything. You, you know what I'm talking about. So, once, if you say that is the answer, that prosperity will come from producing a good or a service and selling it and doing it with the chivalry, then the next question was who will buy? in big quantities and sustainably what you produce, the goods or the service, who will buy them? It is the answer to this question that helped us to debunk the pseudo politics of identity. To answer this question, you, you hear how I, I, I will answer it. Who will buy what you produce? We found that many Banyankore did not buy the milk, the beef, or the bananas, which are the products of those people, of theirs. Why? It was because many of them have similar products. A does not buy from B, and B does not buy from A. Who then are the buyers? that mainly buy what the Banyankore produce. It is mainly the non-Banyankore or the Banyankore living in towns that buy the milk, the beef, and the bananas of the Banyankore. In the 1950s, I, I went to school, not because of a single Banyankore other than my, my parents, not one. No Mnyankore other than Kabuta can say I supported Museveni. No. If you bring him, I will give you 100 cows. But the, the people who supported my, uh, our education were three people. One was a Muganda man from Kampara here called Warsim Mpanga. That man was a cattle trader. He would buy cows from all over the, our area and bring them for the slaughter for the Kampala market. 
So my father had cows, he had, he had wealth. He, but he didn't have money. He could not take a cow to the school, say, I'm paying school fees with a cow. He had to convert the cow into something easy to take to the school. Where could the headmaster tie the cow? Headmaster, because other way, Kabuta would have taken the cow. He said, This cow is worth so much. Then the, the child started free. But he, he couldn't. So, Kabuta was getting money from Warsim Zifanga, who was buying cows. At that time, when the economy was still down, still this small population of Kampala needed meat. And, and the Indians who are here. So what's in Panga was the bridge now. There was another Muganda called Bichenya. The Muganda was calling him Bichenya. His, his real name is Bukenya, but you know Banyago cannot pronounce it because some of it is. So he was called Bichenya. He has got a son, a grandson who is working in the in the Opportunities Commission. And, and his family is in Barra. They are in Barra. That in Kenya was buying cattle for the Barra market. That in Barra market also had come up a bit. So, Kenya would also buy our cow. Then, 1958, a white man called Shea. He had built a house at Ishaka there. He was now buying cows for the Chirembe mines. That Chirembe mines had come up. It needed meat. And one day, my father's cow tossed to Mr. Shea. And Mr. Kabuta took it back home. He didn't want to be sold. <laughs> and and he, he gave it a praise name. Where I got the praise name. He, 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 pray, he, he made a praise name for police that it had tossed the white man. But, but that's how I got money for education. So you can see, even when the economy was still really primitive, the signs of what was correct were already there. For you to come and tell me, we as Banyankwere, we as Banyankwere, and you mobilize me to form a Banyankore group when you are not solving my, my, my livelihood problem, you are an enemy. So that's why, therefore, we were able to, 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 to. therefore, the prosperity of the Banyankore, and, and now the relationship is much stronger now. Well, at that time, it was only some few occasional cows for beef. Now, if you add the milk daily, 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 you find somebody is milking 1,000 liters of milk. If the Kampala people don't buy them, what are you going to do? You're going to commit suicide. What will happen? The milk, the beef, the bananas, I think if you are to station people at the Antonde and you, 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 you do census of the vehicles, carrying milk, carrying beef, carrying uh, uh, bananas, you would run out of paper. So this shows you the real interdependence. I went to a place called Orom. Have you ever heard of Orom, you people? Uh, not just Kampala people. Yes. Orom is there after Namukora. And there are the Acholis who are quarreling. In fact, I, see, I, 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 have a, I, I have a date with them. They were saying, we are producing Simpsons. But the language are cheating us. 
the language, we are the middlemen. They come and buy from their churches in Rome at a very low price. They come and sell the, the, the things in Kampala at a very high price. So you can imagine, the people in Orom know Uganda, the importance of Uganda. And, and that's why I promised them a fuso to carry their simsim direct to Kampala. So that they, 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 so that they, they bypass the langis who, who are cheating. <laughs> who are cheating them. So therefore, the prosperity of the Banyankore is more dependent on Uganda rather than on the Banyankore rural areas beyond the production of the goods and services. This is how we identified the first ideological principle of the NRM as patriotism. That's how we, where we got it. We say, ah, so what do you call this? To love? Because remember, th there is our local word here, Moyo Gwagwanga. But that Moyo Gwagwanga, that is the spirit of the nation. It can be translated to mean the, the spirit of the tribe. So that's why we said, no, we need a word to describe Uganda as fatherland. And that's how we came with the word patriotism. Why love Uganda? Why? It is because you need it for your prosperity. We soon found out that the internal market of Uganda was not enough. This is the need for the regional continental markets of Africa. We are therefore to love Africa. Why? is because we need it, we need Africa for our prosperity. We have got so much production now, maize so much, milk so much, bananas, eggs, cement, steel bars, all in surplus and surplus. The internal market is not enough. So it is because we need it for our prosperity. Hence the second principle of the NRM, Pan-Africanism. The third principle is social economic transformation so as to enable, to be able to produce the goods and services. Next is Uganda Prisons Services. Deputy Managing Director and General Savit, you will join the group photo. One person, Pastor. That are needed in the Ugandan market and the African market. Democracy is our principle number four. These four address the historical mission of creating prosperity for our people. 
The next historical mission is to create strategic security for Africa against all threats. You have heard of some actors in the world working for achieving four dimensional security. Superiority on, 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 in the land forces, superiority in the air forces, superiority at sea, and superiority in space. Where does that leave Africa? That some people want to be superior on land, they want to be superior in the air, they want to be superior at sea, they want to be superior in space. So, me, a guerrilla, who survived because of people could not see me, how will I survive if somebody is on the moon, on the moon looking at me like an insect? So, that's the second historical mission. How can Africa get strategic security? Uganda, relying on the four ideological principles, will become a first world country. We have already achieved the low middle income status with the GDP per capita of US dollars 1,146. However, the question is, can Uganda afford an ocean-going navy or a deterrent space capacity, even when it becomes a first world country? This is what I was asking the big people in Nairobi the other day. USA, Russia, China, and India have been to the moon. UK, Germany, France, Japan, ETC have not been to the moon. They are still here with us also. <laughs> True and we have UK, Germany, France, Japan, ETC have not been to the moon. They are being the first world countries, notwithstanding. Economically, they are very advanced, but they can't manage to go to the moon. What does this mean? It means that there is meaning to size. Size matters. However well trained you are, you cannot have light weight boxing with heavy weight. That's why they say, ah, Rwanda and Akatonia can know. You know, we need to Small is small, whether developed or not. During the Second World War, the first victims of German aggression were the highly developed countries of France, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, Norway, etc. They were highly developed, but they were overrun by Germany. And they had to be defended by the United States and by Russia. Therefore, size matters. That is why the NRM stood with Marim Nyerere on the issue of the East African Federation. We need the East African Federation for our strategic security. We need a powerful defense force with the ability to defend us in the four spheres on land, air, sea, and in space. Hence, the two elements Pan-Africanism, common market to deal with our prosperity, and the political federation to deal with our strategic security, the ability to defend us against all and sundry. That leads us to our third historical mission, the brotherhood 
of the African peoples. You have heard, you have heard it broadcast repeatedly by the reactionaries and traitors that Africa is populated by very many tribes, etc. etc. In fact, the 1.5 billion people who will be 2.5 billion in the next 26 years are only divided in four linguistic groups. All the Africans are just in four linguistic groups. You heard me talking with this Mugwere man. He's speaking in Yankore badly, and he says that is Mugwere. Or oh, I speak Mugwere badly, and I say it is Mugwere. But yeah, I can understand what he's saying. If you say, how can I feel to, to understand that? If I'm in uh, Yankore. When I went to, you know, where, where, is, where is near Mbari? Very far. So, me as a Nyankore speaker, I can sit here. And groups from Mwanza in Tanzania, where Magufuli was coming from, when they speak in their local dialect, Chichiziza, Chikerewe, all those all the way up to this Bakor Rachida. They speak, I will follow what they are saying, without translation. When I first went to their area, there was a group, there was a group of women. They came dancing. Mukali Muntu, Mukali Muntu, Mukali Muntu. Many Mukazi, for them they call it Mukali, Mukali, Mukali Muntu, meaning that the woman is also a human being, as if it was in question. <laughs> Mukali Muntu, Mukali Muntu, Mukali Muntu. They were, they were being led by a woman called Mwana Moiza. I liked her so much, I appointed her an RLDC for a long time until now she's very old, I retired her. I went to Kenya, the former vice president of Kenya, Mr. Imud Awori. When I was there, the women came dancing. Ibula Mlangom seven years in it. Ibula Mlangom seven years in it. How can I fail to understand that? Ibula Mlango opened the door. Museven has already come. So, these are the ones they are calling tribes. These people are in, are, are, are in fact only divided in four linguistic groups. The Niger Congo, which means the Bantus and the Kwa, the Kwa are the groups in southern Nigeria. The Nilo Saharan, the Nilotic, our Nilotics, our Kushitic, like the Somalis, the Nilo Hamitic, like the, the Iteso and Akaramajong. These are all what we call the Nilo Saharan. And you will find that those dialects are either similar or linked. The Afro Asiatic. Arabic, Tigrinya, Amhara, and the Khoisan of Southern Africa, the Bushmen. So there are only four groups in Africa. Moreover, we have Swahili, which is a non-tribal language that has distilled a new language from the Bantu dialects, from Arabic, from Portuguese ETC. It is therefore possible to unite these African peoples for the sake of their prosperity and strategic security, but also enhance cohesion. With those principles and the historic missions, the student movement was able to challenge the bankrupt ideology of the politics of identity, of tribes, religion, and gender chauvinism. 
So I won't tell you where the Arondas came from, how they came in. Don't just you see Aronda was doing this, was doing that. It was part of, of a, big, a very, very big force. Therefore, with those principles and the historical missions, the student movement was able to challenge the bankrupt ideology of the politics of identity, of tribes, religion, and gender chauvinism. It is this ideological menu that we are serving our trainees in the Florosa camp in the 1970s. At that time, our recruits were mainly peasants or secondary school leavers. These are the people we trained at Montepuege in, in Mozambique in 1976-78. However, following our crossing the Kajera River along with the Tanzanian army on the 11th of February 1979, we started recruiting university graduates such as El Tumine, uh, and others that time. In addition to the school leavers, in the second half of 1981, the NRA had a fresh intake of new university graduates, Aronda, Tumkunde Henry, Kasura, people like Sande Mukuru, Barrio Barije, Ndivarema. What happened to Ndivarema? Was he not a university graduate? Yes, Ndivarema, I don't know what happened to him. Uh -huh. So, this is the group you are talking about now. They came, because I left to go to look for arms on the 6th of June, 1981. I came, I, I, they had not come. These people had not come. But when I came back on the 9th of December, they had come. This group of Aronda, that group had come. On account of education and ability to write and read, this was a very big addition because many of our, our, our recruits were, were peasants. They could not read, they could not write, but they could pick up the book. But then we had a problem. Some of the jobs need, need reading, need, need writing. Moreover, writing in English, Danangu. So we are really stuck. The, on account of education and ability to write and read, they helped us to man the intelligence department. Because intelligence, how would you have an intelligence department if you don't have records, if you don't write, if you don't read, if you only word of mouth, I saw, I saw, I saw, then no record, how would you manage? To man the intelligence departments and being the political commissars, because commissars also need reading, reading, writing. The combat commanders were mainly the second school leavers and the peasants. Like if you take the group which attacked Kampala, they had groups who were calling battalions, but actually they were brigades. They were big groups, like the one who attacked Kampala, uh, and Fred Mugsha. Uh, first Battalion, Patrick Rumumba, Third Battalion, Stephen Kashaka, five, fifth, fifth Battalion, Charigonza, Seventh Battalion, Julius Chanda, Ninth Battalion, Chef Ali, Eleventh Battalion, Ivan Coretta, I saw him there, Thirteenth uh, Battalion, 15th Battalion, Samson Mande, 17th Battalion, 
Adam was what? The one who went to Rwanda. 19 Battalion, Peter Karim, then uh, 21 Battalion, which I left in, in Kasese, then in Tumkundi. None of this was a university graduate. But the only one who was involved here was, uh, at the, the high level, was Tinyefuza in the West. Not commanding, not commanding, uh, 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 commanding a grouping, a grouping. These were the commanders of the brigades that assaulted Kampala starting on the 17th of January. The only university graduate in command that time was Tinyefuza on the Western Axis, commanding forces that included the 19th Battalion or Brigade of Peter Karim at Viso. The graduates were jokingly called intellectuals. There was some tension between the graduates and the, the other people. They were jokingly called intellectuals. Those intellectuals, on account of better discipline, because they were more disciplined, the more, 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 more more discipline, uh, came to save the army, save the army. When many of the combat commanders died from natural causes, not from combat, but from, from. Given the training we had given them now, but when we took over power, these intelligence officers, like Aronda, intelligence officers, they, they, are not, they had not co led combat missions before. They were intelligence, PCs, and so, uh, political commissars, but in the, in the fighting battalions, like you had, uh, Aronda was in third battalion, the one of Lumumba. But when we took over government, given the training you had given them, when we took over power, under OBC, officers of best course, in Russia, the USA, you heard that uh, Aranda went to Fort Eleven was, they filled the gaps left by the diseased combat commanders and gave us time for the maturing of the younger officers we deliberately recruited in the 1990s to rebuild the officer corps of the defense forces. Because we were really going into a crisis. Because these commanders who died, they were very, very experienced. Corruption, there was no corruption in the NRA. No. In the five years we were in the world, there was only one case of uh, a boy called Rubare, who killed Korean, Korean, North Koreans, military people, on, on, on Bombo Road. They killed them. So when they killed them, they, they came as heroes, oh, we have killed, we have killed. But then later on, I got information that they killed them in order to, to, to hide the money they had taken from them. The, the people had surrendered peacefully, uh, but because they wanted, to, they, they had money or something, things like that, they killed them so that they don't say that these people took money from us. So when we came to know the story, we arrested them. We arrested the Rubani. But later, recently, I was checking the story, I was told that no, it was not because of the money, only there was some... Confusion. But that was the only case of corruption in five years. And it seems also it's... it's uh -huh. So th those commanders were, 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 were very good, but many of them died. So, but... The